the internet. Welcome to World View Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on today's show, questions about asking Jesus into your life and the problem of cheap grace. You know, I really hate cheap gifts too. And when it's my birthday and somebody gives me something and it's really clear that they didn't put enough money into paying for that purchase and it's this kind of cheap grace kind of gift, I'm not very thankful for that at all. Hmm. Stick around. <coughs> Email. All right, here we go. You know, I wish, I wish, I wish I could do a German and into Russian accent the way that Pastor Buto did at Higher Things this past summer. I'm so jealous of this hilarious Baltic impersonation that was German. It was, yeah. Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzung. And I am German by heritage, so you can't accuse me of racism. Ha <laughs> ha. Hey, Pastor Fisk, what does it mean as a Lutheran to ask Jesus into your life and be saved. All right, so what does it mean as a Lutheran to do that? Well, if a Lutheran is doing it, what it usually means is they don't know the distinction between being a Lutheran and being a standard run-of-the-mill vanilla nice, nice, evangelical Christian, which basically means Baptist and or Methodist. <gasps> because that kind of language just isn't language that Lutherans usually use because it's so often used by Baptists and Methodists who don't even know they're Baptists and Methodists, but think they're just Christians. And insist that being just Christian, they're the only Christians, and so basically slew the rest of us from actual salvation without even knowing it. Ah, it's a different issue. But since they use that language as sort of code language for what we would call decision theology, or the theology of the human will being part of the source of salvation, that God has done all that he could do, but we have to exercise our internal power of decision or, or choosing or, or loving or, or faith even to grasp and receive and hold the gift, like God's holding out the gift, but I have to grab it with my hand and be saved. Asking Jesus into your life is code language for that lifting up of the human will as a means of salvation. Classically called Arminianism because of a guy named Jacob's Arminius disputations with the Calvinists in the 15-1600s, but more classically than that called Pelagianism because of the false teacher Pelagius' confrontation with Augustine in the 3rd and 4th century, for which he was condemned by the entire Catholic Church, which at the time meant everybody who was just a Christian. <laughs> like, seriously. Also then, this is what Pelagianism is what the Lutheran Reformation was all about, because Rome, in its Catholic theology, which wasn't so Catholic but was more papal, had become semi-Pelagian in their teaching about the human will's involvement in salvation. Now, there's no question that humans have wills, right? The question is whether or not we are free enough in our will to choose God for ourselves and so accept his grace by our own power, or whether God is an electing God, a choosing God, a God who gives a free gift which we don't have the power to choose, much less even accept, especially since, as we've taught here so often, that free gift is to kill you. I kill you! Right? With the law, in order that he might raise you with the promises of Jesus. So what does it mean when a Lutheran starts talking in this language? It means they're probably adopting Methodist and or Baptist anthropology. That is, a Methodist or Baptist understanding of man, and what man is capable of in his soul, and his spirit, and his will. Pool Which means that they're on the way to denying the real ramifications of original sin, and they're also on the way to undermining the concept of total free grace, that salvation is an entire gift by grace alone, right? Like Paul said, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it's a work of God, not by works, lest any man should, you know, boast about this, right? They're on the way to losing that. Whether they know it or not, that's the process of theology they're adopting. Most evangelical just Christians don't know that they undermine the gospel with the way they present it with this false anthropology. And it's not like we should hate them for that, right? But we don't want to just adopt that way of thinking on our own. That theology is actually harmful to faith and eventually can undermine an individual's faith and cause them to despair and doubt themselves out of the faith or to become arrogant and pharisaical in their view of themselves as more righteous than others. This is the whole 
whole thing with false theology. False theology isn't bad just cuz, right? It actually hurts people. How? Most of all, by hurting their faith, by undermining the trust they can place in something outside of themselves for salvation, namely Jesus. We'll get to that in a later show. But here's the thing. So the, the phrase, ask Jesus into your life and be saved, uh, stripped of all context and, and, and getting rid of every possible other interpretation of that phrase that is common in the parlance of American Christianity, isn't necessarily evil or wrong. I mean, there, there is this reality that once one has been killed and raised by the law and gospel of God, you will want to pray that, you know, God's name would be hallowed in your life, that his will would be done in your life, that his kingdom would come in your life, right? And this is to ask Jesus into your life more and more. As the regenerate man, though, this is the thing, it is not you in your flesh, in yourself, but the, the Spirit convicting you of your sin and so of the righteousness of Christ, making you alive to basically beg for, and this is the great act of faith. The great act of faith is not to grasp, but to beg. Dear God, I have nothing. Lord, have mercy. Fill my empty sack of life with your grace that I might live forever. So here's the thing, you're at this big revival, right? And they've manipulated you with all of the music in order to get you excited. And then they come out and they tell you, well, all of that's the Holy Spirit. And so here's some Jesus. Please choose Jesus. Now, if along the way, they've also somehow managed to preach about sin and the cross, there's a good chance that you actually do believe in Jesus. And in that moment, say, I choose Jesus. Here's the thing. And here's the important thing. That is not the moment of salvation. The moment of salvation already happened. Right? You're choosing Jesus. You're saying, I want to believe in Jesus because the Spirit has already worked faith in your heart. See, what's going to happen next, though, is they're going to tell you for the rest of your life, you have to look back to that moment of choosing Jesus as the moment where you can be confident that you're saved. That's problematic because it's really easy to doubt your emotions. <laughs> right? I mean, if you don't doubt your emotions, uh, you're Spock. Fascinating. Yeah, and even Spock doubts his emotions. Seriously. Even Spock's father doubts his emotions. This weakness disgusts me. I hate it. Where is my logic? Seriously. So it's not that it's entirely wrong and evil to speak that way. However, because of false teaching that is entirely wrong and evil, which has adopted that way of speaking as its code language, so that in those words is contained a whole lot more than those words by themselves would normally mean, it's really not a Lutheran way of talking. Instead, what Lutherans talk about is what the Bible actually says, you know, Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized, right? Now, to be sure, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Uh, you, you are saved. We're not against faith. We're not against, in fact, we're the ones who kind of coined that term, faith alone. But faith has to have an object, and that object has to be outside of us. And so, because Scripture teaches against the idea that we are part of our own salvation by the act of our will, instead we proclaim repentance in the face of the law, which has condemned us, which is basically say, yep, the law condemns me, I got nothing, and the gospel, which is God promising you that he's saved you anyway, and this creation of faith will no doubt lead to you desiring more of God in your life, for which the Lord's Prayer is a great way of asking, because it's kind of what Jesus said to do, right? Yeah. Obedience. We demand obedience. Actually, we don't, but, you know, if Jesus says pray this way, he's probably right. Oh, and so, baptism is actually the gospel too, so repent and be baptized is not repent and do good works, it is repent and believe the promise that you are washed entirely clean by the blood of Jesus. Woohoo! Ah, we got time for one more question, uh, I hope. But first, it's time for your Issues Etc. Question of the Week. Pastor Fisk, I've been having a lot of conversations with my girlfriend about Christianity, and I was wondering how to explain the Trinity to her without completely confusing her. An excellent question, my friend, and yet a terrible question at the same time, because the answer is, well, you can't. And that's kind of the point. The Trinity being God's essence in his eternal economy and imminency is beyond our comprehension. And if it were not confusing, I don't think he'd be much of a god. So, how to explain the Trinity without confusing somebody? Not possible. To quote Augustine, one must believe to understand, and one can then see that the essence of God's eternity is beyond our comprehension, and yet, in his grace, he has revealed some of it to us in such a way that we can even confess it and talk about it. We just can't quite wrap our minds around it. Although it really helps if you understand that the only way you see any of it anyway is in Jesus on the cross. But, with the first question, how do you explain the Trinity? Well, that's what the creeds are for. And in particular, the best place to go is the Athanasian Creed, even though it's a little bit difficult and wordy. So to help you through it, I highly recommend listening to Pastor Will Whedon being interviewed on Issues Etc. on the phrase Unity in Trinity and Trinity in Unity. It'll be a great starting place to sit down, listen to it together, and then discuss it afterwards. Check it out. <laughs> 
Pastor Fisk, how would you respond to a Roman Catholic's claim that Luther basically said, if you believe you are saved, then you are saved? This was in a discussion that basically framed Luther as not understanding the Greek word for faith and making way for cheap grace. Vermögensordnungszuständigkeitsübertragungsverordnung! First off, did the person accusing Luther of not understanding the Greek word for faith know Greek themselves? Because if they didn't, um, conversation's over, right? Because Luther, like, of all people to accuse of not understanding original languages, uh, you're, you're portraying a great ignorance of who this man was. He was, in his time, a, a scholastic genius of original languages. That, that's what this guy did professionally for a living his entire life, was he read the Bible in the original language at a time when the development of linguistics was, like, at its peak. The scholars in this era were so capable of reading the languages that they discovered. Luther wasn't just fluent in Greek and Hebrew, he was fluent in Latin to the extent that he could write papers in it, right? He, he was writing in these languages, which is, I mean, I, I do Greek Tuesday every week. I can't write in Greek. What I can do is I can kind of use my lexicon to figure out some stuff and I can put the grammar together a little bit. If I already tried to speak a sentence, oh my goodness, right? I don't know if Luther could speak Greek, but to accuse Luther of not understanding Greek is in its own right a, a pretty stupid thing to do. I, I don't know if you want to say this to your friend, that's a stupid argument, but you know, um, that is an ignorant thing. You are lacking knowledge in who Dr. Luther was. He was a doctor of the church, made so by the Roman Catholics for the sake of the fact that he actually knew what he was doing. Huh? And as he was doing this, knowing what he was doing thing, reading the text in the original languages and teaching on them at a university level, he came to realize that what was being taught in the scriptures was not what the Pope was teaching. <laughs> Particularly as he was selling grace for money. Yeah, you, you deal with that one, Roman Catholic, and then we can talk about the meaning of the word faith. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> and speaking of cheap grace, any grace you can buy for money, I would say that, that'd be some cheap grace. <laughs> right? Fly comes. And we're going to come back and talk about cheap grace in just a minute, because that's its own issue. Let's deal with this accusation about faith. The Luther said, if you believe, then you believe. Well, kinda, right? Uh, not exactly. Just because someone says, oh, I believe, it doesn't mean that they actually believe. Uh, but we can't judge the heart, and it's not really up to you to judge your own heart in this regard, because if, once you start down that path, all you can do is doubt. What we can judge and can know is what the Word of God actually says. And what the Word of God actually says is that you are saved by by Jesus and for Jesus sake and if you do believe that proclamation that is the Holy Spirit's work in your life that is what we would call salvation but salvation isn't like this one-time event in your life that just vanishes is it's while we're here in this veil of tears especially a daily drowning and renewal by that same Word of God that doesn't just include you're saved so go live however you want but is in fact you're saved from the sins which you commit which you now admit are evil and harm other people right so even though there's gonna be a desire to go do those things and you will in fact do those things from time to time to a certain level within this range i mean you're not going to be like killing people from time to time but you will be angry at them from time to time and that's both uh breaking the fifth commandment being saved from the evil by the promise that jesus has in fact saved us from our evil doesn't exactly set us free to be evil right what it does is set us free to trust that jesus is going to save us from all the evil we see and that mercy in itself god promises will have such an effect that you won't go out and do as much evil as possible. And this is mysterious. This is counterintuitive, and this is the book of Romans. That is actually the gospel that creates good works. More good works come from the proclamation that Jesus has done everything and you're saved than from demanding that you go do good works. Now, can one demand that someone go do good works in a way that creates those good works from the people in front of them? Well, externally, yes. It's called the curb of the law. The more that I, like, hedge you in with these demands, you're going to do them. But the problem is, will you be doing them in faith, or will you be doing them out of fear, or for the sake of rewards you think you're going to earn? Which is, in fact, the greatest sin. Uh, to do things because you think you're going to get benefits from God as a result of it. You're going you're to raise your status in God's sight. That's actually what Adam kind of did in the first place. Kanarienvogel! So while it is true to say that if you believe the proclamation of Jesus' death and resurrection for the sake of your sins, it, then, then you are... In in fact, exhibiting what we would call the Christian faith, and, and thus are saved by grace through this faith, this is not to say that there aren't hypocrites in the church who, who lie about this and, in fact, are unbelievers. And we confess this in the Augsburg Confession. See, when the Roman Catholic starts attacking Luther, he really shows, again, a tremendous ignorance. If he wants to have a discussion about Lutheranism, he should discuss the Augsburg Confession, because that's the thing that the Roman Catholics rejected, which is, frankly, quite Catholic doctrine, just purely. Like, in the great historical sense of the word, the Catholic teaching of the Church Universal throughout time and space is the Augsburg Confession. We just happen to write it down in controversy against the Romans who were denying their own historic position on this stuff, right? So, now that's where you should go if you're going to talk about these things. In terms of the Greek word faith, pistuo, notice I'm using my hand dandy logos app to look up 
Danker. Best looks to call him for the Greek English. Greek letters is hard. I'm learning. This duo. To consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. Jesus died for you. Pistuo in that is to consider that to be true and therefore worthy of trusting. Two, to entrust oneself to an entity in confidence. Three, entrust. Four, be confident about. Five, consider possible. It's not that tough. So I would surmise that this individual doesn't understand what the Greek word faith means in the least and instead has accepted what is probably the teaching of the magisterium of the church, which is the compilation of errors that they have founded as doctrine and can never change, which makes faith into something more or less than mere trust in what God has said. Right? This is the problem. Adam lost faith. He stopped trusting what God said. That led to death. God promises salvation. Adam trusts that, that the seed-born woman will save him and is restored to faith. Thus, the church is faith throughout history until the man, Jesus, comes and does it. And still now, that promise is what we wait for to be achieved. And either we are restored by the Holy Spirit into trusting that this will bring us out of the veil of tears, or we're trusting in ourselves to somehow be a part of it, make it happen on our own. The problem with Roman Catholicism and Evangelicalism, both, the same theology is that they keep trying to insert our own wills back into the process rather than simply trusting God's got it taken care of and that he is, in fact, our Lord. Yeah, kind of comes down to that. So anyway, thanks for tuning in to World Gear Everlasting. Remember, if you like what we do, trying to get this law and gospel out into the internet sphere web world. Oh, they have the internet on computers now. You can always join the Lutheran Ninja Clan. $5 a month makes this show possible and also helps us build that foundation towards bigger and better things in the future, such as more content, not necessarily by me, and or the promotion of this show out into the wilds of the dark realms of evangelicalism. The spatula of purity shall scramble the eggs of your malfessence. So good. <laughs> Until next time, rock on. Verkehrsinfrastrukturfinanzierungsgesellschaftsgesetz. That's a liquor reference. Liquor reference. He